So how is the immune system put together? So it used to be you'd have two divisions of the immune system, what they call innate immunity and adaptive immunity. That has begun to change now. Now there is a third level to the immune system, what's called barrier immunity. When you think about the immune system, a lot of times you'll hear these two lumped in as passive immunity. Wipe that away, erase that. There is nothing passive about the barriers and the innate responses that your body produces. Um, they are very active. Uh, they can be long-term, um, but they are different from the adaptive immunity in that the genetics to these are hard line encoded in your genes, right? You're inheriting them directly. That is not true for the adaptive immune system. It literally adapts to what it encounters. And this is the whole basis of vaccines and um, vaccine-based immunology, antibodies, and so on. If you want to know about that, I gave a senior symposium talk six years ago. That's in the catalog here. You can look it up and hear all about that. Um, the basic principle, though, is you have barriers. Skin is one of these barriers, and then all of those juicy, wet, mucus-covered membranes of your body, reproductive, respiratory, digestive, um, these are barriers. The, the goal is basically to keep things out and prevent entry of stuff that doesn't belong or that isn't acting correctly. Um, if those barriers are penetrated, then your body responds with a whole set of uh, systems, things that phagocytose these invading particles, um, a set of cells called natural killer cells, a response generally called inflammation, though that's, again, we're changing this term, and potentially fever that deal with this. If this is not sufficient to deal with that threat, then your body tunes into adaptive immune system and begins to call in T cells to um, use what's called cell mediated immunity and tumoral immunity, and that's antibody based immunity. Um, so macrophages kind of fit into this middle box. Um, macrophages go back to the early days of microbiology and immunology. Eli Metchnikoff discovered them in starfish, um, and then antibodies were discovered and they all got pushed to the side for most of the 20th century. So macrophages, I remember having our one lecture on macrophages in grad school in 1990, um, thinking, okay, those are interesting, but I don't need to pay attention to them because all these lymphocytes, they're really cool, and that's what we're gonna study for the next 20 or 30 years. Um, turns out that there's a lot of cells, and this is a short version of cells in the immune system. Um, so if you know anything about development and blood, you have to talk about hematopoiesis and all the cells that come about from that. Um, and it starts here with stem cells. So in your bone marrow, you have stem cells, and these are self-renewing cells. When they get the right signals, they go in one or two different directions. They either become a myeloid cell or a lymphoid cell. Lymphoid cells produce all of the variety of different lymphocytes. Um, fascinating stuff. New ones coming about all the time. I don't know much about these innate-like lymphoid cells, but they're clearly becoming important players. Um, and this is a very generalized set because there are subtypes and subtypes of subtypes and so on. It gets quite complex. Um, on the other side, you have what are called myeloid cells. And these are cells such as monocytes and macrophages, granulocytes, um, and also things like megakaryocytes, which produce platelets, and erythroid progenitors that produce red blood cells. So all the cells that are traveling around in your blood, they come from this pathway, given the right kind of stimulus to produce them. So we're interested in this pair here that come from what's called a granulocyte monocyte progenitor. Um, and so monocytes are the circulating cells in your blood, right? They get out from the bone marrow and they go on their very way through the blood until a signal says, okay, let's get off the blood here. It could be any tissue in your body. And that might be your brain, that might be your liver, that might be your spleen, so on. So every tissue in your body that isn't the blood has its own set of personal macrophages. Right? This means, as an immune functional cell, they're everywhere. And the problem with the way most people have studied the immune system is they compartmentalize it and say, okay, we're going to look at what happens in the spleen when we do X. We're going to look at what happens in the brain when we do Y. Well, that then ignores the fact that something might be going on in the gut, or the liver, or the pancreas, or somewhere else, and not necessarily equilibrate. So that is a problem in studying things like inflammation because you may be looking at one compartment and ignoring another compartment. Um, other important cells, the thymus is a, is a principal one. Again, we don't focus on the thymus with this uh, because that's where T cells are developed. Uh, but it's a critical organ as well. 
Uh, and again, it's very subject to damage. Uh, particularly if that happens early, it might affect your ability to generate T cells. So we're going to get macrophages out of this. Uh, when they move as monocytes from the blood into a tissue and become tissue resonant macrophages. So this is the paper. It came out last week in PNAS by a group headed by or first author is Sender. Um, and this is the first paper I've ever seen that showed a good breakdown of the cells and their relative proportions in the body, right? You've probably seen a bad commercial for activity or something else that says, hey, 70% of your immune system is in your gut. This paper says no. Uh, and I was always skeptical of that personally, but again, there was no data. They went and looked at the data that was out there, collected dozens of papers, and did some um, analysis themselves. But what I found was interesting, in addition to just the numbers of cells, um, notice that macrophages, like two times 10 to the 11th macrophages in your body. Like these are spread out throughout your body. That's a huge um, number of cells. And they mass 600 grams, right? So think about your body weight. They used a 73 kilogram male as the textbook subject for this, right? 600 grams of macrophages in your body. That's because they're pretty big cells. Uh, but monocytes are, are not even a small portion of that, right? They also are there. And so these together make up a good proportion of cells that can be involved directly um, in the initial stages of inflammation. <coughs> uh, they did conclude that the three principal tissues in your body where immune cells are housed or where these guys are located, um, spleen, thymus, bone marrow. So, when you hear somebody say, hey, all that immune system in your gut, there's a lot of cell activity going on there, but the cells themselves aren't necessarily housed there, right? So one of the things you need to take into account is that, okay, compartments, but how are these compartments communicating with each other, right? And this is the way they communicate with each other. Two vascular systems. One, the cardiovascular system, which is a closed system, and then the lymphatic system. So, Lymphocytes traveling through the blood will migrate out of the blood, particularly in the capillary beds, um, encounter things there, and then begin traveling back through the lymphatic system, right? And in the lymphatic system, they're hard to see on here, but you have um, lymph nodes periodically throughout the body. Right? You've probably been to the doctor and they feel you here and you know, armpits and places like that. That's where lymph nodes tend to be in higher density, right? They're basically looking for swelling. You have some kind of inflammatory response that's leading the cells to be housed there. Um, and then eventually those cells, if they pass through the lymphatic system, get dumped back into the vasculature um, as the blood is entering back into the heart. So these cells are mobile and they're responding to things. The molecules you've encountered, whether they're pathogenic or not, are interacting with these cells and possibly causing stimulation. Right? So classical inflammation looks kind of with like what we see here. Um, and here's our a classical kind of macrophage. Most of my textbook pictures come either from a textbook called Janeway's Immunology uh, or Kuby's Immunology. Those are the two kind of standard texts in immunology these days. And you'll probably see somewhere early on this kind of breakdown of, okay, what tells us we have inflammation, right? Heat, right? Everybody's had some kind of wound where you have heat, pain, redness, and swelling. That's great but that's only part of what goes on in inflammation. Um, and so we're starting to get deeper into what inflammation defines or how it's defined um, by looking at where cells are and what their capacities are. Um, so one of the things that inflammatory cells and macrophages in particular do is they produce a bunch of what we call soluble mediators, um, or that's my term, um, but they get lots of specialized terms depending upon what type of scientist or biologist is looking at these. Um, but there's a particular group here which generally get classified as cytokines. And you've probably heard of some of these, um, interleukin-1 beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, um, IL-12, or interleukin-12, and this one called CXCL8 now, it used to be IL-8. Um, this was the hot new cytokine when I was in graduate school 35 years ago. Um, now it's like old news. But what happened in the interim is they discovered that there, some of these aren't called cytokines, they're called chemokines. They're chemoattractive molecules. They're not information signaling molecules. And so they came up with this whole new set of nomenclature based upon their amino acid structure. Um, so there are, I might say, hundreds of chemokines. 
you look in textbooks, they break it down into types and subtypes and subtypes of subtypes. It gets quite messy, actually. In an inflammatory response, and the classic one is something you might be familiar with, getting a splinter. Um, every textbook probably has that. I think most general bio textbooks probably have that as well. Um, but it stimulates local tissue macrophages to respond to that damage. Right? So classic inflammation might be what we call damage-based inflammation. That could be because of a pathogen or it could be from a wound, something that breaks those barriers. And that macrophage responds to that invasion and starts to put out these cytokines to attract other cells. So its collaborator in this is the predominant white blood cell in your blood, the neutrophil. And the neutrophil will swarm in, right, these chemoattractants bring in neutrophils and other things that basically are designed to kill and destroy what's there, right? If you have the right kind of infection, you'll get pus, and pus ends up being basically dead neutrophils and dead bacteria, um, and all these cytokines. And hopefully, this will happen, right? You'll get this redness, swelling, kind of wall off the area, and in a day or two, it'll be going away, and your body won't have to worry about it. Well, if these things keep up, though, some of them don't stay low. And you get what are systemic effects of some of these cytokines. Right? Um, some people want to, will call these endogenous pyrogens. And that's a very apt name because all three of them contribute to generating fever through the hypothalamus. So they get out into the blood, they circulate around, and that leads to changes in gene expression in your hypothalamus, and now your body temperature goes up. Um, there's a lot of work looked at, okay, so how do we get there? Well, it could be through the brain. Some of them are actually transported through the blood-brain barrier. Um, they also affect nerve terminals in the liver, so you'll get macrophages then activated in the liver. Those are right next to the vagus nerve terminals, and they'll stimulate that and get some of that. Um, there was some really good work in the early aughts done at UVA, transecting vagus nerve in rats and giving them external or peripheral cytokines and seeing no generation of fever. So we know that there's multiple ways to get a fever. It's not just um, direct stimulation of your brain, but it's peripheral things. Again, those compartments at play. Um, and then the neutrophils and the macrophages that are there start to release a whole bunch of things that contribute to those classic symptoms of inflammation. So these might be the cytokines I just described, right? Everybody know what I mean when I say cytokine? It basically means a molecule produced by one type of lymphocyte that affects another lymphocyte. Um, chemokines, these are chemoattractive molecules. Um, but lipids too, right? Some of that pain, so prostaglandins and leukotrienes. This is why you take some of those non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to break that cycle and stop enzyme function. Um, but things like kinins, but also neurotransmitters, right? So in this context, we don't call them that. We tend to lump everything under the cytokine chemokine um, name. But here you have neurotransmitters that might play a role as well, right? And if you're coming at it from the endocrinology viewpoint, you might start to call these hormones if they get out and they circulate. Right? So I'm very cautious with using those precise terms because it's all context-based. Right? Same molecules, right? norepinephrine can be all three of those. Right? It just depends on whether it's between two neurons, or whether it's between two lymphocytes, or whether it's coming from your adrenal glands into the blood and circulating throughout your body. It has different effects under different conditions. It's the same molecule. So we need to start to think differently about the molecule and contextually why it might be there. Um, so our classic inflammation is what is now defined as loss of structure. Um, so you have normal structure, you have some kind of damage, and macrophages in that tissue respond to that damage and initiate an inflammatory response that hopefully closes it up and you get back to normal. Second type of inflammation now is being defined as what's called loss of function. So this might be something more in your gut where you have something that binds normal enzymes and those enzymes can no longer function to do the jobs that they were intended to and that induces an inflammatory program localized. So you get a different type of system that responds still under the general heading of inflammation. The third type is the one here at the bottom, which you might have to look on the side if you can't see through my podium. Um, what's called the disruption of homeostatic control. This is more of a theoretical one at this point. Um, not well established by the, the literature, but it's the idea that offsetting homeostasis, normal processes that maintain balance, can also induce uh, an inflammatory 
So inflammation has gone from, hey, look, we got damage and this thing happened, to, hey, look, there are different ways to get to what we might define as inflammation, and that's complicating matters, right? So it's not just a simple term anymore. You have to qualify what inflammation is. So what I'm talking about today is really this type of model, a classical inflammatory pathway, um, and what goes on with that. So inflammation, here's a, a diagram that shows you macrophages and neutrophils cooperating. Um, so you have, key thing here becomes pathogen recognition. And oftentimes we talk about bacteria. Viruses can do the same thing, but it's slightly different in the way the program works. So we're gonna focus on bacteria because that's a little bit easier to handle, uh, particularly in the lab. Um, but those macrophages there begin to do different kinds of things. And we're gonna, I'm not having to find this yet, but I'm gonna talk about M2 and M1 macrophages in just a minute. So keep that in the back of your head, right? But you get this neutrophil migration, right? They come out of the blood, they follow those chemokines. It's kind of like following breadcrumbs, right? Ooh, ooh, we smell this, let's go this way. Um, they migrate in and they do their damage. Neutrophils are really kind of cool cells because they just get there and they pretty much explode. They go, ha, target, bam. Um, so they're filled with all sorts of chemicals, those soluble mediators, but they can also use their DNA to trap things. They have these things called neutrophil nets and they're literally just reweave their DNA into this net to trap bacteria. Um, relatively new discovery, but it's kind of fascinating that the neutrophil goes, okay, I'm dying, what else can I do to stop what's going on? Hey, let's use my genes to do that. Um, the macrophages then respond to that. So this becomes kind of a back and forth as long as this bacterial signal is there, the macrophages are going to be stimulated, the neutrophils are going to do their things and keep coming in. Um, eventually, the macrophage will change um, and shift to what's called this M2 phenotype, and that phenotype is kind of an anti-inflammatory form. Um, so the signals going on here become really important for defining the system that you're working with and how that could be in inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. So in the mid-90s, while I was away from immunology and doing other things, this discovery came out. It's what's called pattern recognition receptors or pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Um, Charles Janeway at Yale discovered what is now known as toll-like receptor 4 in about 1992 or 93. Um, and this revolutionized what we think about as an aid immunity. Right? What it says is, there are germline encoded receptors, and this is toll-like receptor four, the classic one, that recognize patterns that are not present in vertebrate mammalian hosts. So this might be something like bacterial cell wall products. Um, it might be something like double-stranded RNA, which is not something you would normally encounter in a mammalian cell. And this would trigger a response from that cell, primarily a macrophage, but it could also be um, something called a dendritic cell, it could be a fibroblast, there are lots of things that can respond to these, um, but macrophages are a, a prime candidate for this. Um, and that initiates these inflammatory processes. So pattern recognition kind of revolutionized the way we need to think about the innate immune system and the fact that there are these molecules out there that are non-self that then might be responsive in a particular way. Uh, one of these is you see here, bacterial lipopolysaccharide. This is a common molecule to gram-negative organisms like E. coli. Um, and it has a number of different portions to it, but the big one that we're concerned with is what's called the O antigen, this N piece. And there are literally hundreds of seropites, even in just E. coli. Um, the nice thing is, toll-like receptors pretty much generally say, hey, that looks different enough and not uniquely different enough to respond to, and let's stimulate this macrophage in response, right? So I actually had um, a governor school student do this one year who needed a project, and we looked at different versions of O antigen, LPS, didn't matter which one we threw in there, we pretty much got the same response from our cells. Um, but there are other variables in here, some core molecules, and then this thing at the bottom, if you've ever done tissue culture or cell culture work, you see endotoxin tested. They're basically testing for the presence of this lipid molecule to make sure that it's not contaminated by bacteria. So that when you put your cells in there, they're not getting stimulated just because of the media you put them in. Um, so these, re these uh, receptors have a, a wide range of functionality. 
there's lots of language associated with them. The, the standard one you'll see is this one down here at the bottom, the PAMP, the pathogen associated molecular pattern. But it's a, it doesn't just have to be pathogen related, it can also be damage related. So in your own cells, there are molecular shapes inside, say, the wall of the membrane of your cells that when they're disrupted, now they look like foreign things to the macrophage, and the macrophage goes, hmm, let's clean this up. Right? So macrophages end up being a very heterogeneic and plastic cell type. Unlike a lot of other cells in the immune system that tend to do their killing work and then go away, macrophages tend to do a lot of their work and then go back to a resting state. So when you have a macrophage in a tissue, it's basically called a resting macrophage. Then something has to stimulate it to prime. And then it has to go from priming with more stimulus to what we call an angry macrophage. So uh, the language around macrophages is, is progressive. And once that stimulus that makes it really hyperactive goes away, it can go back to that resting state. So I kind of liken macrophages to a, a combination of um, security guard and garbage collector all rolled into one, right? So they're out there collecting garbage and they come across something that's really nasty and go, oh, time to become the security guard. We gotta do something to activate the body uh, and call in reinforcements. Because in my job as garbage collector, I can't handle this. Other things are needed. But when that's cleaned up, they're going back to that job and just kind of patrol around in that tissue and wait for the next thing to happen. Um, and so macrophages are these large globular cells. Um, most of the artistic renditions have pseudopods, but if you notice that picture at the beginning, it kind of had ruffles, so it's, it's more ruffle-like than it is pseudopod. Um, but you'll see some pictures of the ones that I grow in the lab, and they do kind of extend out um, on plastic surfaces. So they identify these foreign molecules or these, these stimulatory molecules to pattern recognition receptors, whether they're PAMPs or DAMPs, um, and they ingest them. So one of their big functions is phagocytosis, and that's what macrophage means, it means big eater. Uh, so they just ingest things, and these vesicles then enter into the cell and begin to fuse with lysosomes in those cells. So you get phagosomes and lysosomes and phagolysosomes, and progressively this moves from um, uh, a relatively neutral pH to a higher pH, and that activates a lot of the things that are in that phagolysosome. So you get all sorts of en enzymes, um, all sorts of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, and the idea is whatever's in there is just gonna get torn apart, right? Let's chop it up, let's break it down, let's kill it. Um, Sideline, one of the problems with some pathogens like tuberculosis is it gets into these vesicles and then it doesn't get killed. And nobody quite understands why TB is able to hang out in a macrophage and live its life there. Um, it's one of those big mysteries that nobody's really been able to solve. What does it do to defeat all of these mechanisms a macrophage has to bring health and digest and kill things? Um, I played around with that, but it's not as easy as, as it might sound on the surface when you start to look at molecules and, and other kinds of things. Um, so, this cell type then uh, is a prime mover in initiating inflammation. Uh, and again, that classic inflammation is one where we're talking about damage and pathogens. So we're really talking about macrophages in things that might be like skin or uh, more peripheral kinds of tissues, right? You don't want a macrophage that is that violently active your gut or your lung, right? If that happens there, then you get really debilitating chronic diseases or potentially death, right? So macrophages, in a way that we're not quite understanding yet, are tuned differently in different cells, right? So the macrophages inhabiting your gut aren't as reactive as the macrophages inhabiting your skin, right? You don't want a high inflammatory response in your gut. If you have that, and if you've ever had one, you probably know is not pleasant, um, that's gonna be a real problem. So some pathogenesis in a lot of these diseases we're, we're seeing like allergies and asthmas and uh, Crohn's disease and, and all those gut associated inflammatory diseases are probably some way related to mistuning of macrophages and how they control that microenvironment and inflammation. So here's that basic pathway, right? They sense through pattern recognition receptors, 
something on a pathogen or something on a damaged molecule. They ingest, they initiate a signal transduction process that releases or produces cytokines. Um, they create this phagosome, which then fuses with lysosomes, and you get your phagolysosome. lysosome. Uh, and they're producing a number of different things like uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, and hopefully killing that in here with those molecules which are ripping electrons off of surfaces, or with enzymes that are damaging or isolating things that are necessary to the bacteria, like iron. All right, bacteria don't do very well when they don't have enough iron, so if we starve them of iron by binding it to lactoferrin, you're going to potentially eliminate them. Um, and so cytokines that are released here, here's our endogenous pyrogens again. This is your basic system. So macrophage functions tend to be things like, okay, we're the garbage collectors or we're the phagocytic cells, um, things like that. Whereas macrophage capacities tend to be how those things operate. How much nitric oxide is produced, how much reactive oxygen or hydrogen peroxide is produced, what enzymes at what levels are produced. Um, and the question then becomes how you measure them. I said there are subtypes. So one of the things we know about macrophages is there are two different versions of them, and those versions differ depending upon the type of stimulus, right? So the pro-inflammatory one, that's what we call the classical macrophage, and this is kind of the metabolic systems that go on. And so one of the cool things about these classic inflammatory macrophages is they say, okay, I got a lot of work to do now. I don't have time to do the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. That's too slow for me to generate all the molecules I need to in short order. And so what they end up doing is, it's not really well seen on this one, but you can see they're focusing on glycolysis. So they do a high energy, high speed glycolysis to produce molecules because one of the things they need to do is turn arginine into citrulline through INOS and produce that nitric oxide. So that's one key pathway. And you also see reactive oxygen species here do the same kind of thing for killing bacteria. And so this is targets for measurement, or at least was early in macrophage research, because you can look at these transient species and their breakdown products and semi-quantitate what's going on. Keep that in mind when we get to a couple later things I'll come back to. The other form of the macrophage is the M2 or the alternative macrophage, and this is a tissue repair, kind of this is the garbage collector mode. And it's focused more on mitochondrial action, Krebs cycle, and, and pathways there. So it's saying, okay, we, we don't need to ramp up glycolysis, and it actively breaks down arginine so you don't get these reactive intermediates that lead to oxygen and nitrogen radicals. Um, it makes it sound like these are binary. It's more of a continuum, and macrophages will kind of move back and forth between them because, depending upon the stimulus that's going on. So when you're starting to think about experiments, with macrophages, even if you're just looking at an isolated macrophage, you have a lot of things to think about to create a microenvironment that's going to actually do what you think it's going to do. Um, I learned this through experience. So I started with my doctoral thesis in psychoneuroimmunology, or if you're in Europe, you call it neuroimmunomodulation. Um, and I worked on morphine-induced immunosuppression looking at natural killer cells, so one of those innate cells, and how does a chemical that induces behavioral changes through the nervous system affect the immune system. And it's an indirect pathway. It's a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal connection that actually does that. And if you want to talk about it, I'd be glad to talk about this. Um, but it was quite clear. And it's always weird when I see my research cited somewhere with like a short sentence. It's like, okay, that took like five years to do all this. Um, I then went on to Minneapolis where I did research on IL-1 signal transduction. Um, didn't know for many years that we were on a completely wrong path. Um, and there's multiple subtypes of it and they have pro form. There's a lot of things that were not known that made it almost impossible to do that. I then went to University of Pennsylvania where I worked on prolactin receptor signal transduction and breast cancer cells. Um, and the work I did there got published the year I started here. So that was another project that ended up being cloning that wasn't signal transduction, even though that was the intent. Um, and so through this all, what I began to see is, okay, there are things that modulate the immune response. I then started teaching at Allegheny College, and they had just instituted a course that was basically a research lab course. So instead of having a lab for intro bio, 
they said, okay, we're gonna do modules and teach students basics of research um, and research writing with that. And so I had a group that wanted to study Echinacea purpurea and a model I'd used in this research. I said, okay, I was at that point very skeptical that that was gonna show anything at all. And this group of novices generated results that were positive. I was like, well, that's weird. Okay, maybe it's a fluke. So this was a modular course. I had a group in the third module in that that repeated that work exactly. I thought, okay, that's weird. Let's look at what's going on. Well, it turns out in the field of echinacea, the general consensus is that it affects innate responses, not adaptive responses. We were looking at adaptive responses. I'll never be able to determine this because the reagents I used are long gone, but I'm pretty sure we were looking at an LPS stimulation, a contamination of the echinacea, not actually echinacea um, way back when. Um, but I have worked with students on this and, and been interested in how does that modulate macrophage responses. We've looked at pesticides, um, I've looked at melatonin, I've looked at now, one of the things I'm interested in going into, I had a student the last couple of years looking at this, um, PFASs or polyfluoral fluoro alkyl substances. Um, if you follow the literature, they are like the hottest topic on the planet in terms of toxicity. They're everywhere. Um, the ones that are the most toxic aren't even produced anymore, but they just, they deep, deep go into the environment and so they're there, we're getting exposed to them constantly. So the question is, what and maybe how do they affect inflammation? Um, and nobody knows the mechanism by which they work to cause toxicity as well. So there's a, a really fruitful area of research there. Um, so how do you modulate the immune system? Well, when you think about that, you have to think on multiple levels and develop models to do that. So I learned mouse immunology in my graduate work and then moved into cellular immunology um, and molecular. Now you almost have to start to think about genomic levels as well because all of these are flammable. Um, I haven't gone quite that far, but that may be an eventual target. So my model system is these guys over here. Um, I picked them up from a colleague who was a fellow graduate student when I taught, uh, when I was at MTV. Um, she was at the University of Richmond the year I taught there. And these are the raw 264.7 murine macrophage cell lines. Um, so they were created in 1978. Uh, by a virus-induced tumor, and our basic culture conditions is we grow them in a little flask like this, and every three days we go in there with this little spatula, and we scrape them out, and we start them up again at a 1 to 10 dilution. And that's pretty standard. This is the textbook definition of how to grow them. When we want to do an experiment, we count them up. Uh, we put them into a 500 microliter volume and a 24 well plate at 4 times 10 to the 5th cells per well. Let them sit overnight where they re-equilibrate to this environment and settle down, they attach to those plastic surfaces. We come back the next morning, wash them, and then we treat them with bacterial lipopolysaccharide in a range from zero to 100 nanograms per mole. So we're doing a dose response effect on this set of cells and looking at how they respond to that, saying, okay, this is like that classical inflammatory pathway, here's our LPS. So that's our model. That sits for 24 hours, and then we come back and take supernatants and we look at uh, nitrites in that supernatant, that's a breakdown product of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gas, so it lasts a few seconds when it's produced. Um, so you get nitrites and nitrates, but it's easy to measure nitrites. Um, we can then also save samples for ELISAs and uh, protein can be collected for other purposes. So the questions we started to ask uh, were, what are the optimal conditions for this? The first five or six years here, I was using a media and we were getting some really weird results. I had a student um, who spent most of the year working on large polysaccharides and how they stimulate macrophages, and then about a month left in the, in the year, the cells stopped responding to anything. Uh, and I think it was probably because we weren't growing them well. We were using the wrong media and the wrong conditions. Um, what is an appropriate dose of liberal polysaccharide, right? A lot of it, we'll see a little bit later, uh, a lot of people throw in enough that it's probably more than you would have if you had sepsis from three or four different microorganisms at the same time, which means is what you're seeing real? Um, another question is, how is the relevance of the cell culture model to what actually happens in the body? That's a tougher one to answer. Um, and part of the problem is uh, we're working in mouse and mouse macrophages are not human macrophages. Human macrophages aren't good at producing nitric oxide, so you don't have a quick and easy way to measure results. Uh, and then of course, can we use this to do other things? 
So here's our standard dose response. Uh, we run from 0.1 nanograms to 100 nanograms per mil of LPS um, in that 500 microliter volume and measure nitrite concentration. And in a normal response, we see this nice stair step. So this is an analysis of variance saying there's a difference in this group. Um, and so 60 to 7, 70 micromolar is pretty normal for the cells in a, in a good pattern. The added problem with cultured cells is that after you grow them for a while, they start to not perform quite as well. So most um, people using raw cells now say, okay, after 30 passages, we're done with them. We're going to start over and get a new set uh, because they may or may not perform as well. Uh, but this is our standard model. So the question then becomes, what if we look at other things, right? So here's pathways of nitric oxide and uh, oxygen. These are the two key enzymes. So if we were looking at proteins um, in our cells and measuring nitrates or nitrites directly, INOS would be the protein we want to measure. So that's inducible nitric oxide synthase, an enzyme stimulated in the macro. So it happened that I had a bunch of students around 2011 and 12 who were all doing different things with this system. And I passed a set of cells and gave one set to one student and one set to the other student. One had a good looking experiment, the other one had cells that basically went numb. They responded to nothing. Uh, I thought, okay, what's going on here? What's the problem? Um, and if you remember Avery Erickson, she was the one who got the dead cells, essentially. So our project quickly changed to, okay, what are we doing that's not standard? This is when I realized, okay, some of our conditions aren't quite right. And so we began to test the two standard culture medias that are reported in the literature. What's called Delveco's modified Eagles medium and RPMI 1640. And RPMI stands for Roswell Park Memorial Institute. This is formulation 1640. I would not have wanted to be the graduate student working on that project. Um, right? Oh, let's change this salt by a couple of grams or milligrams. Uh, but it turns out that this is a standard culture medium, usually for lymphocytes. So I was very familiar with this. And so I was using that. Well, here's a set of experiments, and this is actually one done recently by Alice and Bob, so we've gone back to start to look at this model and really question some of the basic assumptions. Um, so here's our raw cell response, pretty normal. Here is the same cells grown in RPMI, parallel, not a very good response. And so here you have uh, a significant difference also by t-test at this. And a lot of people are doing using this system with RPMI and saying, hey, we're getting a normal response. Look what we saw. I'm not sure I believe a lot of that research. Um, so the question then becomes is what is different about these media? And so um, I had a student who actually started doing this work, um, Diana Spangler, uh, and she went and looked up the two recipes for these. Um, so one key thing is arginine, and this will become important. Notice the arginine in DMEM is lower than the arginine in RPMI. Um, but it turns out that one of the other key things here is that glucose that's there. So here we have basically two grams per liter of glucose in RPMI, whereas in DMEM, we have four and a half grams of glucose. Um, and it's interesting that now when I go to order this, uh, they report this as called high glucose medium makes a lot of sense that you want to grow your macrophages in high glucose media because they're doing a lot of work when you ask them to respond to LPS, right? They need a lot of energy. And so you're basically starving them in a two glucose, two gram glucose environment. Um, so the experiment that Allison and I did last week for the first time was this one. Um, and so this is basically a glucose recovery experiment. We added glucose back into RPMI. And so this set of cells had been growing in RPMI for 10 passages. This set had been then essentially grown in RPMI with higher glucose for four passages. And you'll see they look relatively the same. And in fact, here at the, the highest dose of LPS, we get what might be refractory. And I think that might be because of the higher amount of arginine. They're just able to respond better because there's more substrate there for them to produce nitric oxide in that environment. Um, of course, we'll have to test that by playing around with arginine in these, that might be a little bit harder uh, since we can't add it into that. Uh, we might have to add it into the DMEM and add another bar to this experiment. Um, but it's quite clear, again, that we have that difference between DMEM and RPMI. 
and now we add that sugar back in. And you know, this, this would be logical, but nobody's ever actually tested this before, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I had that same look too. It's like, how come, because people don't pay attention to what they're doing, they take what somebody taught them to do and they just keep doing it without questioning. This actually followed on a series of experiments I started um, in 2019. So uh, I had been wanting to work with bone marrow derived macrophages, right? Okay, so we're working with cultured cells, but is that real? Is that what we might see from a cell developed in an animal? But I didn't have enough knowledge from the literature to develop what are called bone marrow derived macrophages. Um, and I happened to have coffee one morning here with uh, a former student, Jackie Baker, who was in her graduate research at the time. And she said, oh, I did this. I worked up a protocol. So she sent us our protocol, um, and essentially she's been our technical advisor on this project, as we take the long bones from mice legs and generate cells. So essentially what we're doing is washing or flushing the bone marrow out of these cells, collecting the stem cells, stimulating them with granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, and generating macrophages. So here's the stem cells at the start of this. Here's the progression of uh, sorry, MCSF that produces macrophages. So notice these guys, they are really stellate. They spread, they get these long projections. Um, here's our raw cells, right? They spread, but it doesn't look quite like the, the bone marrow derived macrophages. And these guys get really granular, right? These, they look like they're ready to respond as soon as they get a stimulus. Um, these are granular, but not to the same degree. Uh, so we do this over seven days, we collect these cells, we put them both in dishes in parallel, and Delia and I did this, and this is what we ended up seeing. We're like, oh, that's not what we expected. Here's the raw cells, and here's the bone marrow macrophages. Turns out the difference here is the rate of growth of these cells, right? The raw cells are going really fast. Their turnover uh, doubling time is about two to three days, whereas here, they're growing really slow. And so in that same time period, their growth rate is not the same, so now the question became, how do we measure, or how do we count those cells? That was still a problem we haven't quite solved. Um, these come from uh, Quinn Harker a couple of years ago. So she got on the project, we thought we'd solve the cell counting issue. Um, you can see some equivalence here. Um, when we adjust for cell number, they stay relatively the same. Um, so this would lead us to conclude that hey, these are the same, they're behaving the same, right? Uh, which means potentially we could use the raw cells as a substitute for BMEN. Um, we presented this at the Society of Toxicology meeting in San Diego at the end of that year, and we had a couple of good suggestions like, hey, how about another cell line? Um, so went on to do that. Um, last year I spent a lot of time with students characterizing this particular macrophage cell line. And then this is an experiment that I did a few weeks ago um, here's our raw cells, here's our J77 cells, and here's our bone marrow cells. This is just basic nitrite concentration. Um, again, we're not seeing a lot of difference here. It's a little bit weird for the J77s because they usually don't respond quite that well. They're a slower growing cell. Um, and then when we equilibrate this for cell counts, it didn't quite come back up. So results here aren't quite consistent. My general take is these might not be equivalent to raw cells, um, but there's still some other things we um, and you'll notice here at the lowest dose, the J77 cells respond statistically, the, the raw cells and the bone marrow cells are pretty much the same. Um, so initial evidence suggested equivalent functional responses, but we need to account for um, multiple factors here. Maybe not as equivalent as we thought, particularly looking at nitric oxide. Uh, culture conditions clearly play a significant role in considering what's going on. And then some questions we're, we're kind of developing to ask, and I'm going to skip ahead uh, to this one. Um, so there were some reports in literature of people attempting to do this. I'm not convinced they really did what they said they were going to do. So I compared our stuff at the top of this to what they did. Two of the groups used RPMI, so that made me quite skeptical of what was being done. Some of the stuff that they reported, like I have no idea how many cells they actually exposed to LPS, um, and in what environment. A relatively short time for this, and they used five micrograms of, of LPS. That's a huge concentration, right? We have 100 nanograms per mil at the top, and they're using five micrograms. That's not necessarily producing function. It might just be killing the cells. Um, 
and here's some other report as well. They looked at a whole bunch of things. This one I'm not quite sure because this is a macrophage stimulus, not a macrophage product, so I'm not quite sure why they looked at that. Um, when I read this paper, I thought, oh, they're doing exactly what we're doing. And then instead of actually reporting raw or results in quantity, they correlated their IL-6 and their nitric oxide responses. Not quite sure why. They didn't really explain why they used a correlation. Um, and they used a variety of different kinds of things. So you can see there's lots of different types of macrophages, splenic macrophages, bone marrow dendritic. It's a mess. That, that's basically it my conclusion at this point, there's not consensus. Um, and so the question then becomes, what do we do next? Um, I'd like to thank the University of Lynchburg School of Sciences for this. Uh, and these are most of the students that did something on this over their careers here. Uh, and this is just a small set. There are a whole host of other students who did related work, but it wasn't specific to this talk. So thank you.